Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and as always, another excellent episode for you today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time. And if you are watching on the video version or on our audio versions, I guess you can't really watch the audio version, right? If you're watching your screen on the audio version, uh, we invite you to jump over to the video version and follow along as we usually have a real-time conversation for each of these episodes. As always, today's episode uh, will feature a candid story, raw and dedicated to understanding the LGBTQ experience, where it meets at LDS Avenue and LGBTQ Street. And today's episode is no different. It's, a, again, a, a deep dive into the experiences of someone who identifies along the LGBTQ spectrum. We thank you for uh, joining us. We invite you to share this episode and even add a comment below. That is one great way for you to help us expand the reach of the podcast and get this message into the lives and, and homes of those who desperately need it. We first want to um, welcome, before we jump all the way in, to welcome to the podcast, Cole Rasmussen. All right. Happy to be here. Thank you, Cole. Um, exciting to sit down with you. For those who don't know you, and I'm even trying to think like, I've known you for a few years, so. Right, I actually was thinking that too when we exactly first crossed bridges. Yeah, I'm not sure if we burned them or if they. <laughs> I don't think so. I do You, I do remember you coming out to my house when we went yeah. to Dinosaur National Monument. And that was when I was already dating Kent, and so, but I feel like I definitely knew of you. Yeah, we And knew. I think we'd met, and I'm trying to debate if it was officially affirmation. Could have been. Because I actually was trying to do the math of when that the first year would have gone to affirmation. Um, maybe why you, if you have anything else to say, I'll think about it for a second because of what year that was. Yeah, I, I was just trying to consider or trying to remember that. And I know like our paths crossed with the Augensteins. I mean, just, just constantly, like over the years, for, for sure. sure. I've definitely, um, I, I just know Cole. So. I'll have to go back and leave and see too when we first became friends on Facebook because that actually has been a very convenient tool for many reasons to be like, okay, when did I get to meet this person or when did we first talk? And so I might have to go back and look at that. But I feel like it's been, I feel like I knew you before I was dating Kent and we've now been dating for three and a half years. Yeah, and it's so been it's been way before that. But yeah, so it's great to be here and excited to uh, have some good conversations. So for those who don't know Cole like I know Cole, uh, tell us a little bit about or yourself. Don't know Cole. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, right now we actually happen to be residing in St. George, Utah. So I appreciate you getting to come into my home and or our home and uh, be here and let us help have an opportunity to do this. I grew up in uh, Utah County in Spanish Fork, Utah. I currently am the, it hasn't changed. I'm the fourth of five kids. I've got two brothers, two sisters. My family was pretty close growing up. My parents popped out five kids in seven and a half years. So, but uh, in true Mormon fashion, multiply and replenish the earth. Exactly. We'll just do it all on our own. Right. Pretty quickly. There you go. And so, yeah, I grew up in Spanish Fork. I, uh, I kind of grew up in Salem. My parents, when I was a junior in high school, moved out to the rural countryside of Spanish Fork, the very south end of Utah Lake and Lake Shore. So, when people are like, it's amazing that even people who have grown up in areas of Utah County uh, might not even understand the rural agricultural belt that is. In the southern part of Utah County, uh, Palmyra, Lakeshore, Benjamin, Leland, West Mountain, that stretches that whole area. eggs. Oh, exactly. Yeah, which is funny because if anybody has muscle eggs, they, they don't know they came from Lakeshore, Utah. But it is the zip code of Spanish Fork, so I just often tell people I'm from Spanish Fork, Utah. It's easier that way. But um, I, uh, yeah, I grew up in Spanish Fork, had a great family, grew up in a very um, religious Mormon upbringing. I feel like we were always, my family was very involved in sports. Uh, I was involved a little bit more in music, but played sports growing up, had great childhood. I feel like where we grew up, my dad made a point to say, I wanted to raise my kids in Utah County, even though he spent the majority of his career, he was a, a construction guy and actually um, <clears throat> worked for one of the larger, at the time I believe it was the largest, but at least today it's one of the larger construction commercial companies in the, in the state of Utah called Oakland Construction. And I always thought it was really significant because my dad, in many of his jobs up north, he built the Conference Center, Gateway Mall, he built City Creek, he built, you know, uh, the Main Street Plaza, he, the Bountiful Temple, I remember as a kid when he was a general uh, foreman and, and stuff. And so it was fun to know that dad would do all these different jobs for church headquarters. And when he was doing the Main Street Plaza, it was just very common to see every Thursday that the novel sudden here comes the members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles going from church headquarters over to the temple. But my dad's a fairly rough and tough good handlebar mustache kind of guy in the construction world wearing jeans and a final shirt and a hard hat and 
anyways, and so uh, he's a, a pretty chill, pretty, he's a pretty chill dude. But uh, he, uh, yeah, so he kind of grew up in a more country area. I was really lucky to have horses uh, growing up in my family. We always did a lot around our horses, and so we enjoyed being in the mountains and horseback riding and hunting. I also felt like I, I never regretted where I grew up to be involved in children's choir. I was in orchestra and I played the viola and violin and got to sing and I was kind of a very socially awkward kid. I remember not enjoying sports the same way that my brothers did and always being like, why do I feel like I just don't enjoy sports? And it could have been because my oldest brother, I felt like would pick on me all the time and it went boy, girl, girl, me, and then my little brother. So I, I had the two sisters between me and my oldest brother and never stood a chance. He was always significantly bigger and he liked sports and he picked on me so I didn't want to do anything he did and I recognize that probably now but otherwise I did music and did some great fun things had a lot of great friends loved Boy Scouts was always really involved I was definitely my parents child who was like oh I was Deacon's Quorum President Teacher's Quorum President really active involved in the church and always found great peace and just knowing that that was what was taught and everything within the church was perfect it was great so when I was getting ready to graduate high school, I graduated in May of 2003. Uh, I remember my birthday was in September, so I was going to turn 19 that September. By turning 19, that was the gateway to then yes, prepare for... Yes, that proves for... my age right there, doesn't it, though, that now because missionaries did go on missions at 19, yeah. not 18 like it is today. So did Cole serve a mission? Cole did not serve a mission. I graduated May of 2003. In April of 2003, the month before I graduated, is when L. Tom Perry gives this whole rising of the bar conversation. And it officially, for the first time in a couple generations, changes the policies in how young men serve missions. And it's not anymore now just every worthy male serves a mission, but there might be circumstances in which a male might not serve a mission due to health issues. And Russell due, Ballard. Was it in Russell Ballard? I understand. I thought I was seeing it was L. Tom Perry, but when the Corman's rolled then, when they released that whole rising of the bar, um, really changed that dialogue and I was born with a congenital heart disorder and I then I was also the oldest of my class because I was going to turn 19 that following September so at the time of the current regulation or the policies of the church you could start your mission papers three months before you turned to 19 which I got my mission papers on May of the month I was graduating and I knew that the only way I was going to serve a mission if, if I confessed that I had you know me and my best friend had given each other blowjobs during high school I also realized that that friend made it sound like I was more the instigator. Yeah. And he got to serve a mission and I did not. But what I didn't know is that I had tried, or so I, I did confess that I had had oral sex, but then my bishop and sick president were like, oh, but you have all these medical issues. We need to make sure that we get special approval to go on a mission. So for 18 months, I was in limbo and completely thought I just wasn't serving a mission due to my health issues. And my family, to my, or my siblings, did not know that I was that there was more to the story than just my medical, which even I believed I wasn't serving a mission due to my medical because the boy I messed around with, he got to go. Why didn't I mean? Then it's it's going to clearly work out. I just have to be faithful. I just have to hang in through there and you know be strong, and it, it'll always work out. And uh, and so I was working with my dad. Then I ended up getting a job starting school. Anyways, my sister not knowing the whole whole story writes a letter to the church and says we really feel like the stake president and bishop are dragging their feet and not being fair to Cole by letting him serve a mission and I remember in December 2004 I think is when I finally got the official like no you will not be serving a mission and I was just utterly devastated I sobbed and it was a it was a really terrible experience but uh, just a couple weeks before that, my aunt and uncle that lived in Southern California said, hey, if you don't serve a mission, what do you think you would do? And I was like, oh, it's just a matter of time. Like, I'm going to serve a mission. And uh, they're like, well, you know, if by chance you don't and you want to have like a good adult experience, like if you want to come live in Southern California with us and work for the summer, you know, you could. And I was like, okay, but I'm serving a mission. <laughs> and I uh, anyways, moved to California when I found out I wasn't going to get serve a mission. And I was like, fine, I, I got to go do something. While I was there, it was March, then 2005, I get the most random phone call on my flip phone. Uh -huh. I remember the number said private call, and the I Motorola answered it. Motorola Razor. Uh, yeah. Right, it was, yeah, a little <laughs> Motorola. It wasn't a Razor, but it was still a very cool silver flip phone. And I just remember the lady's like, hi, is this Cole Rasmussen? I said, yeah, it is. And she said, 
Oh, well, my name's Linda. I'm calling from the office of Elder Gene R. Cook, who has been asked by President Gordon B. Hinckley to have a mission with you, or a meeting with you in regards to your mission. And I was just like, wait, what? So I processed everything and I was like, she's like, yeah, he'd like to talk to you and talk about your mission and talk about this experience um, and just like, really, and just get to know you. And I was like, wow. So I fasted and prayed and said during the phone call, I thought, I'll come home. So I drove home, went to church headquarters uh, a couple weeks later, met President James E. Faust in the, in the basement, go upstairs to the mission department at church headquarters. And I remember Elder Cook welcomes me into his office and right outside of his office was like the Angel Moroni at the top of the Salt Lake Temple, the green roof that nobody sees until you get high. And um, we sit down and uh, he's like, oh, it's so nice to meet you, da, 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 have a seat, great. And I sit down and he's like, so tell me about your homosexual activity. And I was like, uh, uh, I, I was so dumbfounded and caught off guard and I had no idea and I basically had to have a whole repentance interview again about well so who do you think instigated it more like about how many times do you think it happened well what about this like and I was like and finally at one point I was like why did John get to serve a mission and I didn't oh, we're not here to talk about John we're just here to talk about you well then why is my stake president doing this and this well your stake president's doing what he feels like he needs to do and everything was just dismissed. And I was just kind of like, and I was so devastated. And I, at this point, bought a car, moved to California, accepted the fact that I hadn't, wasn't gonna serve a mission. That was three months ago. And I was like, moving on with my life. And I really did, after I got the, after I got the confirmation of this, or after I got the official word that I knew that I was not serving a mission. And at that point, my bishop still kind of phrased it, you know, just with medical, everything going on. Cole's not gonna get to serve a mission. And that's all I had heard. I was never given a letter, though supposedly there was a letter, but my bishop had it. And I never, to this day, ever got it. I remember like the next day I had to go to work. I worked for a restaurant in downtown Provo. And I just remember driving in on the road I was at and having this overwhelming feeling that, Cole, you can do whatever you want to do. And like that moment, a physical weight went off my shoulders. And I just remember thinking, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. So I go to work. Then I'm like, Janet, my aunt offered me to come live in California. I need to do this. So I call her. I move to California. This phone call happens. I come home. And then Elder Gina Cook says, oh, well, you actually are not serving a mission due to your homosexual activity. And I was like, I thought it was my heart stuff. He goes, well, no, I think it's, it's the time for you to serve a mission has come and passed. But I believe that after you get married and you raise a family, the time for you to serve a mission will happen again. And before I left, he said, can I give you a blessing? And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. So he gives me a blessing and he says in the blessing specifically, that I'll bless you, that you'll be able to start your life, that you will find a woman, that you'll get married, that you'll be able to control your masturbation, that you will withstand from pornography. You'll focus on your life, you'll have a family. And when, the, when your family is raised, you and your wife will get to serve a mission again. And I, anyways, and I, and I have to tell you, it is only within the last few months of really being honest and open and actually telling the whole story, have I actually feel like for the first time, and I mean, it's been over 15 years since that meeting, that I think I actually really processed the trauma that was from that meeting. Because at that point, I ran back into the church. Um, I remember actually before I left Elder Cook's office, I had said, well, can I go through the temple? And he goes, oh, you know, if we ask President Hinckley that, I really feel like President Hinckley wouldn't tell you to wait to go through the temple until you meet your wife and that you guys should do it together. And I was just like, at that point, I was just kind of like, so many emotions that I realized I just like shut down. And I wish I had had the goal at that point to say, wait a second. So this like, I was, because he goes, after like our meeting, he goes, I feel like the time for your mission has passed. And that's where today, looking back, I would have said, wait a second, is this, is this even a debate? Like, was that actually a question? Because I've accepted this three months ago. Like I thought my life was moving forward. That if I thought the mission was here, I would have come in with a completely different understanding. Because I would have been like, here is why I have suffered for 18 months. I have shamed myself. I have done this and this and this. And I have lived in hell knowing that I just had to be faithful. Anyways, I didn't have the goal to say that. And I, didn't, I couldn't put words to that until, until time later. And I left there. And I remember I called my mom. And I go, Mom, and I was on the way home, and I started crying in the car driving from Salt Lake to my parents' house in Spanish Fork. I said, Mom, this is all because of a letter that my sister wrote to the church. 
And my mom's like, Cole, your sister did not know the whole story. She didn't know this. I said, why did she have to write a letter? Why didn't she just let the state president do what he was doing? And the reality is I had been strung out for, especially at this point, almost two years from the time I first got my records, my papers to start the mission process. So I was just, you know, about to turn 21 later that fall. And anyways, and so, and it, and, and on hindsight, I'm grateful because if I thought Alison Nelson was going on a mission then. Anyways, so I come home, I go back to California, I work for the summer and I'm there. And I remember specifically too, my mom calls me, same silver flip phone. And she's like, Hey, uh, you got to Can we talk for a second? I was like, sure. So I step outside and she's like, so your dad and I just left the stake president's office and he thinks that you need to receive your endowments. And I was like, do you want me home this weekend? Like I'll come home. And she goes, no, she's like, you know, your sister's going to be back in the fall. She really wants to go through the temple with you. Let's wait until you get back and you start school. So just after I turned 21, I still received my endowments. And again, like I was so staunch, strong LDS in the church. Uh, I remember the next spring I saw, uh, I was going to institute at Utah Valley University or what was at that time UVSC. Oldie. Oh, oh, so old. At least, I mean, it was a state college rarely at the beginning and then I, at least it wasn't a tech college. But uh, so I was going to UVU and I was uh, in the institute building and I saw an, uh, a paper that said looking for EFY counselors. And I was like, oh, there's no way I'm going to get to be an EFI counselor because I didn't serve a mission. But I, at this point, had received my endowments. And anybody who would look at me and my age and being active LDS sees the garment line. I was like, I'm just going to try this. Why not? So I go and have an interview. And the interview worked out in a perfect way that ended up being one-on-one. -on -one. And I kind of explained and I've said to people at that point, I was like, oh, well, due to my medical conditions and having a pre-existing Medical condition, I was denied a mission, but I still went through the temple. And the guy's like, you're a perfect story. We need to have people like you influence youth. You need to be an EFI counselor. And I ended up getting hired, and I worked every summer for five summers as an EFI counselor. And to me, that represented much of my mission. I also, through EFY, met a really good friend who I was friends with for a long time that he had served his mission in the Philippines. And we were both studying the same degree at the time and working together in a restaurant. And we started a nonprofit organization and then was going to the Philippines. And so for five years we you know would recruit volunteers and do all this service work in the philippines and in my mind like a lot of that represented what i think was my mission and even though i might have taken my student loans and bought a plane ticket instead of textbooks and i regret that decision now looking back in hindsight but it was a great experience to go and actually see um you know uh, the influences of the church let alone like what other countries and other opportunities were but it was definitely as i like every year at efy kept thinking okay this summer I'm going to meet that right girl. It's going to connect. I'm going to feel something and it's going to just be great and I'm finally going to get married. And I met incredible girls, incredible women and people that I really believe that I would look back and say that is a beautiful individual person who has a beautiful soul, is sweet, but just something was always missing, you know, and had some great girlfriends. And then uh, somewhere along the lines and I think too in like the private Bases and times in my mind where I'd find myself thinking about what really most attracts me. I recognized it was men, but again, I, you compensate in ways to make feel like you're covering that up and you don't allow it. But finally, when I was in a space and I allowed it to happen and I happened to be in a situation where I was kind of caught off guard, but I remember a guy approached me and all of a sudden kissed me. And I, like everything in my body, wanted to like push him away and be like, whoa. But something just like said, wait, just hold on a second. And I leaned in and it was just a moment that blew my mind because sparks flew in that moment more than it had, had with anybody else I'd ever met. And I was probably, I think I was about 25, 26. And that's when I was like, oh my goodness, this is the feeling that you hear people talk about. This is the feeling in every rom-com of a movie when the toe tips and you lean back or you just go into it and it's just, you know, the music starts and it's also in a beautiful moment. And here's somebody that I don't know from Adam that is kissing me and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm really gay. How much of that whole experience, and could you kind of preface that with, like, I leaned back, mm -hmm. I pushed away, what was causing the push away? How much of that was religious based? How much of that was you know, and personal I, indoctrination? Absolutely. And I think specifically too, I recognized you have the ability to be strictly or Mormon, but also recognize that you have levels of attraction and the compartmentalization. 
And it sounds asinine to confess now that there were levels of where I would engage and think then that oral sex, we're not making out, so that's not really gay. It's just exploration. It's just, you know, doing what feels good because anybody would enjoy that if they weren't paying attention to what gender was performing the act. And it's like, I was somehow comfortable doing that, but kissing represented everything more emotional connection. And, uh, and so kissing was just a huge, like, oh my gosh, no, I can never kiss a guy. But when it actually happened, it was, and I think in later I was able to actually almost describe, like, it felt better than anything else more extremely sexual because it was such like a, a mind-blowing, like, oh my goodness, I have kissed many women, had beautiful girlfriends, and I never felt that level of excitement, of that level of just enjoyment, where then I was like, oh my gosh, this is why my friends can go make out with their girlfriends for hours, and then talk about why you actually have to be so careful about not letting your hands wander places, because the intensity just can be an escalate of just what else might happen. Where I recognize what I had allowed myself to do with, in rare opportunities was to do certain acts but I wouldn't do the, the, the kissing part. That was just too much. And then to actually like experience it and see how good it was. And I think it was after that experience, I did have a gay friend and I really came out to him and I said, hey, this happened. And let me just be completely honest and vulnerable and say exactly what I had done in my experiences. And uh, anyways, and we became fairly good friends and it turned into something more. And I remember particularly just one night being together and it's, again, it's a rom-com moment, but I think you hear about pillow talk. And for the first time, too, besides what was any physical attraction and what might have happened, we laid there on a bed, just like cuddling, and talked the whole entire night. And, and I recognized for the first time what emotional, deep-level connection meant versus what was just a physical act. And at that point, we kind of did explore a relationship, and frankly, it didn't work out. But it, I look back with such fondness on that moment because I learned, besides what was a physical attraction, the emotional attraction that gave me peace and security being with a masculine or a, a male figure than just this idea of what was, you know, oh, I just need to make sure I'm dating with somebody that's in a skirt and high heels and looks pretty and wears modest clothes. Why did, you need that val why did you need that valid experience? Or what did that experience do for you? I think what it did for me though specifically was actually understand to what level of the emotions I had been suppressing in my life. And so once I then understood, oh my gosh, that is the deep burning feeling of connection that I craved my whole entire life that I was adamantly seeking for and felt like I could never achieve. And when I finally let myself actually explore that, with a man, with a guy, I think it came then the actual shock to truly understand, one, oh my gosh, these are the emotions I've had my whole entire life. This is why I didn't feel like I added up to the same of my other masculine heterosexual friends. And, and, and finally allowing myself to just explore that and understand, oh my goodness, like I am really gay. And then kind of came the, the conflict with what is my real religious views. Um, or my religious foundation. And so it, it, it validated that feeling that said, there's something more here that I need to explore and give my myself that opportunity to really see what it meant. Which would allude that as you're coming to terms or grip with those experiences, that it would probably need to usher in a coming out, a public coming out. Yeah. You know, there was a point too, and I think, um, I would believe, it's my opinion, that many gay men might feel this way, that coming to the realization as to what level of emotional and physical connection I then recognized I was starting to have with men or have feelings for men, especially because as I continue to get older, all the desire and attractiveness I feel like I had towards women and I felt like it was just a light that I kept feeding with energy, but it just kept getting dimmer and dimmer. And, and I recognized at a point too of even just like, you know, the beginning of a semester or the beginning of the year and you set these resolutions of things you're going to do. And I just remember writing down in my journal like, oh, just, just go on two dates this month. Just date, just find two girls to ask out and date two times this month. 
And then I remember I, you know, as we do get busy and I just conveniently let myself be busy um, and also, you know, do a lot of other things. I was wasting time and not probably refocusing on school the way I should. But uh, all of a sudden six months would go by and I'd be like, you didn't go on one single date with a girl. Like something's wrong with you. But my attractiveness and desire to like date women just was continually diminishing. And then I would like restart a goal of like, you're going to go on so many dates. You're going to try to date so many women just to like know. And so especially I think when I started to recognize the level of attractiveness with men and I was like, oh my gosh, you got to swing back the other way and make up and date women. But I recognized like all of a sudden I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm ask a girl out and then recognize though that I just, my heart was not in it. And that's where I think too, I started to kind of come into the more uh, conflict. And so I allowed myself to start to kind of date men and explore that more and found that it was significantly more easy. It was something that I looked forward to. It was something so much more lighthearted. It was something more enjoyable. And then, um, but then came with the reckoning of like, but this is absolutely everything contrary to what you have been told your whole entire life is appropriate, is righteous, is, you know, deemed happiness. Um, there was a, a moment where I remember going back to that, actually that very night that I felt like I actually emotionally connected with a man for the first time. I remember leaving there and it was early hours in the morning and truthfully, we really didn't perform any sexual act for each other. It was just entirely intimate of just like kissing, talking, connecting. And I remember like that moment, uh, that you leave and you feel just a euphoric, a euphorism, is that correct, the correct word? And I felt like I was on cloud nine. And the harsh reality that came later that said, but you should be feeling so terrible right now because you did things that are against your covenants, your commandments, you are an endowed member of the church, you have done your baptismal covenants, you, you should know better. But then I thought, but why does everything feel so validating? Why does everything feel so beautiful? And, and I think that was the ability that I first started to step into that said, I think you need to reevaluate what you know and then the emotions that come with that level of exploration. And as I kind of allowed, like that was the switch that then said, okay. And I think it allowed me to then start to ask questions about what I really believe, what really feels authentic to me and, and, and go from there. Did it change your life? Significantly. One, um, I felt like the, and, and in many ways of coming to terms with your sexuality, with your orientation, and the whole scope of picture you have and what your life looks like is, uh, is it, it started to shift and that scared me. And it scared me then to the people who were close to me who I knew would turn away or that I would lose. Uh, we had a conversation with somebody this weekend and we were in a space in which we were having some really good deep conversations. And I, and I will recognize this and, and hit on it and you can ask more questions if you want, but I feel like the um, people talk about hell and some fire and brimstone. And I know in the LDS culture and belief system, we don't really necessarily believe in a fire and brimstone hell. But the reality, I remember I read something and it wasn't a Mormon scholar, but they specifically said, that hell is what we do to ourselves in this life. And I recognize that fear, that shame, the inability to trust people who I believed loved me and who could accept me, I was putting myself in my own hell. That that was the terror. Um, another prominent uh, person from BYU came out and was on a very popular talk show and I remember watching his video and understanding as he shared his experience that he was afraid to shake people's hands for, you know, 0.2 seconds too long because it might incline that, that is a level of attraction. And even though I can't say that that was the case for me, but it represented the fear of the mentality of, of the loop you put yourself in and what you think you have to do to keep yourself safe instead of embracing it and this idea of like, okay, you know, because reality to anybody else, they wouldn't think twice of it. Where do, we, where do we manufacture that fear? Where does that fear gain traction legs and is created in your experience? Yeah. There are aspects of my Mormon upbringing and foundation 
that I adamantly appreciate. And still to this day, even though I would not rate myself or list myself as an acting true believing Mormon, um, but I have found great joy. And there are great aspects of Mormonism and of the, the doctrine of the LDS Church that has served me well. One of them is that I believe we have a loving Heavenly Father, somebody who truly then wants his children to return with him. Um, and I do confess that I also like, I think differently of that parallel, but, but that served me well in understanding and truly believing that we have a compassionate, loving Heavenly Father. We have a brother, Savior, Jesus Christ, who makes up the difference when we fall short. Somewhere, though, in accepting those principles taught by the LDS culture, and or for that matter, many other Christian beliefs, though I do think there are more um, Christian sects that would believe and say, like, no, God is justice, and if you are, you're either in or you're out, and you're either born again or you're not, and such and such. And I can't necessarily speak to that, but I, that image of Heavenly Father and a saving, lover, loving brother, Jesus Christ, has served me well, and I've really admired that aspect. But somehow, the belief of, of realizing all the shortcomings, all the ways in which we fail and strive to do good but don't, I think somewhere there's that internal loop that then um, escalates the emotion of why then you are not worthy to actually use your saviors or your loving brother's mercy. Um, and I feel like the culture of Mormonism and the conversation, there is never a situation, and maybe unless you really feel like you've experienced it, where I believe someone is like, listen, if you do this, you will be just miserable, you will be hated. Like nobody outright says that, but you hear people say, oh, that person's so amazing, but they left the church, how sad. Oh, they, they were so happy once, but now they're divorced. And it's the, it's the mentality and the way that your brain absorbs the response, especially I think in the emotional body language of when you hear someone can be described as so wonderful, but they have this flaw. That great meme, it's Christ ready to welcome Helen into heaven, but you drank coffee. Yeah, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I feel like, and, and so, but I really kind of question because there are deliberate, when you really look at the Bible, and we break it into the books of Old Testament, New Testament. We look at the Doctrine and Covenants, and the and the Book of Mormon, and doc, uh, and you know that that the Mormon Church believes in. And then if we look at uh, um, James version of the Bible, I feel like there are various scriptures in which you hear Mormons, and I and I will specifically say for this purpose of the LDS culture, LDS belief, picks and chooses scriptures that support the case in which they're trying to teach. And we can go back and we can read where in the scriptures it also gives very firm beliefs here as far as like especially in the Old Testament or even in the Book of Mormon and examples of the Lamanites and, Lamanites and, Lamanites and, Lamanites and Nephites and, and teachings where it's like, oh, like they can give a really harsh law. I don't know if you, I just at the moment that's come to mind is, is um, David, right? And he, he sees the woman bathing on the roof. And... But he also had so many wives. He also had so many concubines. But like you focus on what you need to do of the story to justify it. And you hear like this belief teaching of, of God or Christ and, you know, that is one way or the other. But it's like the church is allowed to pick and choose scriptures that back what it wants. But I feel like there's just so many contradictions as a whole throughout scriptures. Like for an example, we know that one of the Ten Commandments, which I feel like is a very basic Christian belief, that thou shall not kill. But we learn in the very beginning of the Book of Mormon, God tells um, Nephi to go in and smite, smite Lam Lamuel or cut off his head. Am I getting the characters right? Laban. Laban, thank you. Because all I said then, I was like, and I feel like I'm sure he wanted to, I'm sure Nephi wanted to kill his brothers too. But. Yeah, that too, for sure. <laughs> you know, and so it's like, yeah, and I'm like, and here's just a great example. But yet then the Israelites were also our people, the Jews were supposed to go in and destroy certain villages before they could move into it. But yet God tells us not to kill people. And it's just like, and so you, there's, it's full of contradictions. But if you apply that to your own personal life, you're not doing it right. You, you misinterpreted that, in, in that interpretation or... No, no, the bishop said this. He has stewardship over the whole ward, so he has stewardship over you, 
regardless of whatever is might be your individual, you know, revelation that you feel like you received from your Heavenly Father. And I feel like that, it doesn't go both ways. Embrace your personal revelation so long as it matches what we believe our preconceived notion of you yeah. should be. And you know, and I, and I look at some of the, in the current talks, and I won't go into all right now, but I feel like the dialogue is very much like, yes, we, we want you to earnestly pray, to fast, to know these things for yourself. But for those people who do this wrong, or who are the doubters, or who are the lazy believers, that they, you know, they, they're not doing it right. But we want you to know for yourself but whatever you do, also don't go talk to them because that's just connecting yourself with disbelief. But do it our way and we guarantee this is what's going to happen. This is what we're going to feel. And so it gives this idea though too, it's like, okay, but if I really follow that, then if it doesn't work out the way that you just told me it does, I did it wrong. And I feel like that is what creates this loop of this belief of as far as where that fear and shame comes from, let alone we do believe in a family unit, which again is one other aspect that I do admire from my teachings of the church and the belief and the support system that a family should be. But yet everything within our society, and I don't believe there is any society across civilization where you don't strive to have your parents love you and be proud of you. And you also know and understand that if you do anything in contrary to their personal beliefs, that you will be that disappointment, that you will hurt them. And that I feel like the emotional pain is far outlasting of sometimes what is physical pain or trauma. To know that you can have a parent look at you and just say, I am so disappointed, you know, is you'd rather your parent beat you with a leather belt than let your father look at you at times and be like, you really disappointed me. You've really let me down. And anybody in any situation understands that. And so the thought too of being the one person to not be like the rest of the family or to have to, especially for us. Anyway, yeah, I feel like that leads into it. Did you need your coming out experience to solve the dichotomy? The dichotomy of what? The church says you can be this and must be this, but your heart says this is who you are. Your personal revelation says this. The general revelation says that. Was it your coming out experience that launched you into a space of more authenticity and honesty that gave you the freedom of moving on? Or was it wading through the doctrines and principles of the gospel that allowed you to maybe, I often say, separate the gospel of Jesus Christ from Mormonism that allowed mm -hmm. you to thrive and move forward? I think one of the fears, one of the stories I told myself, if I came out, that people would say, of course he let himself be gay. Or of course he doesn't believe in the church, he's gay. It's the only way to justify his behavior or his acts or his you know, falling shorts, you know, uh, whatever you want to call that. And that, that my opinions and how the church teaches, and if I came to contrary belief with the church, that people would be like, well, of course he's gay, so he has to justify his behaviors. And that is still something that I recognize is a very sensitive feeling with inside me because I feel like I also, this is, I'm going to get to your question or believe, I hope I speak to it, but I also though, as I, the short answer is yes. I do feel like learning an authentic true life that, um, and coming to terms with my sexuality did, uh, I, I had to look as I started to understand the happiness possible that my body and soul felt in allowing myself to connect with men the way that I was told never to that that made me look at the church differently and question my beliefs. But I don't believe that it is by those, but that solely for being gay uh, took away my belief in the church. I felt like understanding that I was gay and having to question what feels good led me to say, I have to reevaluate my faith and my belief system that then could say, okay. And then I would say that there was other things that happened, things that I learned that made me lose confidence in my belief system. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it makes perfect sense. And I also think it opens up the door for those who are listening to make that parallel that perhaps, and this might be a novel concept that many of us haven't considered, but we didn't have to sacrifice our morals and values to be authentic and honest. Correct. It's sometimes ingrained into us to 
believe that by leaving the church or separating or creating nuance or even a healthy relationship that may include distance, that you have now become bitter fruit. You have yeah. become uh, immoral. You have a loss of value. Uh, and none of that, based on what you've exper- explained, is true. Right. That you not only held your morals and values, but you also grew both spiritually, emotionally, and, and, yeah. and in that mentally, in, in all those spaces, you were able to thrive. For sure. I will explain one other thing that actually feels really significant that I hope from my perspective and my opinion, other people might find um, understanding in it. But when I really started to come to terms with my sexuality that and understand that I, I guess there's two things that I would love that I feel like I like to share that is probably one of the things that I would love to even say that is a part of my story that I would want people to know and understand from my perspective. One is when I started to take a step back and I remember we very much were told, even though in the LDS belief system, we don't idolize the prophet, the first presidency or the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. In our culture, we definitely rise them above as far as significant figures that besides the Savior, we should model our lives after. Um, and our, I mean, there's a reason why we have books every year on the prophet so we can understand their whole lives. So while we may not see them as deity themselves, we definitely do in a form emotionally or spiritually idolize their that person. Um, and I remember like standing back and just kind of looking at what I then came to term like as I understand what are everything Christ like attributes, Christ like love. And again, like there were so many times that we were told to mirror ourselves after the behaviors of the Savior, and that we want to have these attributes and apply to our lives. There was a significant moment when all of a sudden I thought the LDS church belief culture system does not have the monopoly on that. Anybody who mirrors their life after those characteristics has the ability to live an authentic, true life, regardless of what religion that they are. And I feel like as I started to get to reach out and see other people and just to go back and make the rest of the connection point, as I allowed myself to then see people just as a savior, as I was told, and this is one of the other aspects that I feel like I, I took from my Mormon belief system that has still served me well today is when I started to see people as I was told to, as Christ sees people and to and connect with people and see their, to see them for all the way that the savior sees them and loves them and put aside all judgment, I could accept them for how and who they are. And I have met people who I feel like match the caliber and emotional capacity of people we would identify as great general authorities and prophets, but also because they are not Mormon, are dismissed as, well, then that's only just a banker and somebody. But when you meet people who have great influence but who are not Mormon, you know, it's like, oh, but too bad they're not Mormon. And, uh, or if that person, we could just get them baptized. But when all of a sudden you just see them for the people that they are, and, it, and I feel like they are always people who mirror the attributes of the Savior. And if I could apply those principles in my life, I can do that without being Mormon. I don't have to be, and to be fair, I don't even have to be a true follower of Christ because when I understand that what those attributes and, and how I have them in my daily life and interact with other people, those that is significantly strong, and that is me and my representation to Christ versus my relationship you know, towards the church and how the church dictates how I can live. Because for the first time, that represented true, authentic living, not to mention then at that point too, I, it gave me the comfort to say, oh my gosh, what the church has previously served me, I'm taking with me, and my life now can be far more significant and happiness and authentic. And I can actually take all those things and apply it still in my life without the need to be Mormon or to be still actively involved in the church. The second thing that really came from that realization and understanding is that if I believe that I have the right or the, the belief system to be authentically gay, to live out the relationships that I want to have, how I connect with people, if I believe I can be who I feel like I need to be, by default, it also means that there are people out there who might be adamantly against who I am and who I represent. But, but my same belief 
they also have a right to exist. You know, you hear the Bureau Baptist Church that comes out and protests funerals of veterans. You hear people of different sects of belief that need to come out and protest General Conference because it is their belief system that they have to stand up against something so vile in their opinion. And regardless of what uh, political party you're a part of, who you could be so adamantly strong in one way of belief and then just despise the other side of the aisle, but they all have a right to exist in how they believe they need to exist as I have a right to exist the way that feels most authentically important to me. And when I just saw that through the lens for the first time, I realized, oh my goodness, this is just about people connecting with people, making the best of a life that can be so emotionally hard at times. But we all have something to deal with. You, I mean, you're speaking power and truth to something that came to you as a result of, of honoring the measure of your creation um, for becoming who you were designed and created to be. And, and and you've alluded to what that path looked like, which included some pain and experience and trial and error. I wonder if you have, if you hold all of this knowledge in a bucket and take it back with you, 21 year old Cole, mm -hmm. back to the 28th floor of the church office building overlooking the green roof uh -huh. and the angel Moroni in Elder Cook's office, what would you re-say in that moment, given what you know now that you couldn't say then? Oh man. I mean, especially if I could do everything now, I would say, hey, I'm good. I don't need an interview. I, my life's going to be pretty great. It's going to be really significant. I'm going to meet a lot of amazing people along the way. And getting to discuss not getting to go on a mission, or especially had I known in hindsight going in that it was going to be a full, let me tell you all my sins and exactly what I did and the emotions and how I really felt so that you could judge or gauge me if I was then going to be an honorable missionary. Like, I think I just would have been like, oh, we good. <laughs> we good. Now, had I though still sat down in that office with Elder Cook and been able to tell him the things that I feel like I'm telling you, I feel like, oh. Man, that is a good question, though, and I want to... I don't know, though, because... I, I, I mean, I, I, it's a good question because there's not like a, oh, I would say X, Y, Z, we're done. There you go. Because I feel like I would, I would want to engage with him and be able to say, let me tell you why this can hurt people. But the same belief, I understand why having Mormonism in their life or being a convert to the church and finding the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints can save people. Um, because I understand it, it does both. And of course, everywhere, gradient in between, but it does both. It, it can really hurt people and it can really save people. Um, and I also feel like I would have security in by saying, I know you're doing everything that your belief system teaches you you need to do. But are you also okay if someone chooses deliberately not to do what you tell them to? And how does that change your image of that person? And would it change if you saw that person the same way that the Savior saw the person? The, and I don't know. And I wish in a new way I could sit down and have, a, of course I would love to say over coffee, have a conversation with Elder Cook. Because I'd love to say, this is what that meeting did to me in that moment. This is what that meeting meant to me 10 years later. And here's what it, I feel now from it. The fact that I had to confess to an old man what exactly I did in details that represented the most shameful, dirty times of my life. And then you still put your hands on my head and through the name of Jesus Christ told me to marry a woman and that my life would be able to resume and I'd serve a mission when I raised my family. It was done with the most love and kindness. It didn't serve me well. And I felt like that would, I feel like I would love to see what he would say, but not also too to be like, aha, I got you. Because he was still just a person who was passionate about his calling 
and doing what he believed is his role to do. So I don't know. I actually really love the answer. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy that you wouldn't just say, I'm good and walk out. <laughs> because I, I, think the, I think the aspect of your answer is that visibility does matter. And uh -huh. that, that what these general authorities do at 50 North Temple has direct impact on the lives of people. Mm -hmm. There are, and, and we could get into the topic of, of suicide or su suicidal ideation, um, mental health issues, uh, family separations, loss and sorrow. This topic has caused a lot of difficult experiences. Families who are uprooted, lives that have been separated due to the loss of faith, a transition of faith, a separation from the church, all because of policies and procedures that have emanated from those tall office buildings. Right. I, I love the response that I, I want you, Elder Cook, to see me and see me uh -huh. happy and see me thriving. And it likely didn't happen because you placed your hands on my head. It happened because I rolled up my sleeves, I went to work, and I become who I was always meant to yeah. be. And that's one thing too, is because I feel like there are little regrets that I have in life, and either way, hindsight is always twenty twenty. And there's little things that I really feel like I disagree with, or that I was like, oh, if I could have just done that really that differently. And I am at a place of peace and authenticity, authenticness in my life now that I can look back and see why all of those things were significant that got me to where I am today. And I do consider myself lucky that when I finally came to the position of reconciling with my faith and accepting my sexuality and what that might mean then going forward, that I really, in, in getting a chance to connect with people, feel that I was able to make that transition fairly quickly. And I think it's because I then had maturity on my side because I came out later in life. Instead of people who, and, and, and that goes to that because I feel like there were times I, I confessed and going bawling to single ward bishops when I was in singles ward and, and stuff. So I don't deny the fact that there were grave times of emotional trauma and a lot of work, but I still feel like when I really was like, oh, it, it worked out well and it was a fairly quick transition. Um, but I, I don't know, I, I do see value in the pain. Uh, and I also, I feel like, one other thing that feels important to state, and Kent, my now fiance, helped me put verbiage to this, uh, and, and to quote him really, because he's the one that has said it first, or at least that I heard it from him, is just the idea of vulnerability is telling your story before the end, the end is written. Like, I don't know where my current story is, and I also understand that given the transition of my life, and as I became an adolescent, and went through high school, I experienced some major transitions. And then, of course, after high school and trying to figure out if I was going to go on a mission, then going to California, then receiving the, the, my endowments and EFY and serving in the Philippines and like going through school, which is probably my one biggest regret is I took too long to get through school and kept taking out student loans. But again, the Philippines was great. Um, I feel like there have been so many significant transitions in my life that I also know that I want to give space in the future for what other transitions might come. I feel significant that I currently have a partner, even though I actually don't really like that word. I have a boyfriend who is now my fiance, and he will soon be my husband. And I feel like we, like, I don't know what the future will hold for us. And I know there will be moments of great struggle, as anybody who's ever been in any relationship knows. I would love to believe that we will always be together, but I don't know that to be true either. And I feel like I will understand and would like to believe, even if it's naively, that whatever decision we may come to in the future, we'll come to together at the same time. I, I know that probably isn't the case, but I feel like I don't want to believe that I know that, oh, this is exactly how it's going to go, which I do feel like comes from the belief system, especially as a, as a male in the LDS culture, it's like baptism, Aaronic priesthood, um, Melchizedek priesthood, you'll serve a mission, you will then go to school, you will get married, and you will have children, your life will be set. I feel like, you know, and so as I recognize to see the shifts and the transitions that my life has gone through, that I never want to put too much pressure on what my future really will be because I want to give space for future transitions that I can't foresee coming now. And uh, But looking at my life right now, I acknowledge for the first time I truly do feel like I love who I am today. 
I love the authenticity that I have. I love that I give space to other people to be who I feel like they need to be. And I believe that everybody has that right to go through the pain and then find reasoning for themselves. I always hope that it really works out well, but I know for a fact that there are gonna be people who will struggle. And it's so unfortunate when you look at statistics to know that we will also have so many youth that'll still probably take their life and unfortunately be successful in that attempt. I pray it continually gets less and minimizes. I pray that there is room for people to have faith in continually going on and that they will understand that happiness is due to come, but it's more and less the mentality that you choose for yourself and not the emotional stress of what we, what we sometimes tell ourselves it's going to be like. Yeah, and all those things that you just described, all I heard um, openness, the ability to look forward to the future. Um, I think an effective podcast or an effective opportunity to share your story is within the space that in five years you can look back at this opportunity to sit down and share your story and say, that's where I was at then. Mm -hmm. And that I wasn't confined and boxed in, that, yeah. I, that I wasn't restricted by certain um, expectations or realities. So I hear what you, you speak of, and the thing I don't hear is I'm restricted by, I can no longer, I can't achieve this because of. And I think that's kind of the beauty in this story is that the world is open. You yeah. have the opportunity to explore. You have given yourself the permission to not only thrive, but also to fail. And, and I think, I mean, who, who wouldn't want that? Yeah. No, I think that's very true. And I, and I will be the first one, too, to understand my privilege. And I feel like that's fair because that is something that as I've got to see and connect with so many people that don't fit into, to use the phrase, cookie-cutter shape of Mormon doctrine and Mormon teaching, I recognize that I've come from a place where I have been fairly fortunate in my life and that I do know that I do have a form of privilege. And even as a white, homosexual, cis male, I know that I still have a certain level of privilege. And I, if ever I have the ability to speak up for somebody who is less privileged than I, I, I would hope that I would and understand that. And I, and I feel like that encourages me going forward. And I look at the situations in the very political world that we live in right now and the fact that there are youth who are so aware of themselves and being transgender or gender nonconforming and then losing their rights because the state says that we will not do this for anybody who's under that age. And I recognize that is still something that I don't even understand because that's not my story. But when I look at situations like that and realize, oh my gosh, like I don't have the state coming in. Well, I mean, if all of a sudden they said that they took gay marriage away or if they took, you know, or then said that homosexuality was a sin in which you could be arrested for as it was even through the 70s in various parts before, even though if it wasn't maybe treated on or acted on, you know, I do, I recognize that I live in a country and a society that allows me to, to make those decisions to not put boundaries on what I can and cannot do being authentic to myself. But I also understand that there are very specific people in my society that don't also have those same luxuries. That being said, I think it is still so much more of a power within you to come to that decision than it is this idea of waiting for somebody else to do it for you. What advice would you give to the non-LGBTQ community to support 21-year-old Cole? Um, man. Gosh, that is a good question. You know, going back, I think I give space to myself too because I was doing what I thought I needed to do. And I look back and I feel like, man, if I didn't do EFY, I probably could have actually have had a job that would have paid for school so I wouldn't have taken out so much student loans. I could have like allowed myself to actually date in my early 20s and get to know my, my orientation <laughs> then in my 30s. Um, but I also feel like I was so scared, so scared of anybody finding out that I just put on a huge smile and just like pushed through. And I don't think if anybody had said, hey, there's something different about you and it's okay. Tell me about that. And like actually like wanted to know and given me a space to be like, I don't think I match up like other boys do. I think there's something different about me and I'm trying really hard to date girls, but it just feels really heavy and it's not enjoyable some days. 
Like, I wonder if someone could have just put their arms around me and said, it's, you know, that's okay to be different. Some people are. But your life could still be great. There are so many things to look forward to. And I feel like I wish that would have, could have, could have been the case. Same question. How does the community support 37-year-old Cole and um, his community? I feel like applaud me. I feel like I've come a long ways. I feel like I'm so excited for what is my future. And even though I sometimes am scared at the responsibility, on a very personal note, we're trying to also buy a house. And that just feels like a huge, besides the fact that it comes with a very large dollar number, um, that feels like a very large commitment, you know? You also get your adulting merit badge. So. <laughs> yeah, I think I finally got it at 36. But I, um, I, feel like, I feel like support Cole is also ask me. Like, let's talk about it. Um, Communi communicate. Yeah. The beauty is in the dialogue. For sure. And not the shame, the disassociation, the run from. It's interesting mm -hmm. that we, we spoke a lot about scripture and doctrine and policy and the gospel. And one aspect that we don't talk much about is this concept of suckering. When someone is in need, we run to them. And, and the opposite is human nature. That means when someone feels infirmed or sick or inflicted, we run away from them. Mm -hmm. The opposite is to sucker and to run mm -hmm. to them. The advice might be run towards people in what you might even believe is their infirmity mm -hmm. and realize that it is their greatest blessing. Yeah, absolutely. Because when I came to realize that my sexuality actually really was this much of my character, but at the same time, but because of this much of my character, it allowed my ability to grow this much by accepting myself. Like, yes, I identify with my sexuality as a characteristic, but also because it gives me now a sense of community. Um, I also identify it with in how I maybe connect with people, uh, you know, friends. And I like, yes, my sexuality is this much of who Cole Rasmussen is, but I do know it serves a very big part of me as well. Um, and so it's like, I don't know, and I feel like maybe it is still that idea of like I can pick and choose when it's important and when it's not. And, uh, you know, for this purpose right now and being a gay Mormon, it's obviously a, it's a, it's the whole discussion. But for how I work every day, or if I just go to the gym to try to take care of my body, like it, it, if I interact with somebody in the grocery store, like it, it's nothing, it doesn't matter. And so it just, yeah, of just of what that is and how you use it and, and see it as like the tool, but it, it also gave me the sense of freedom to just let stuff go, connect people with who they are when they are in that moment. I pray I always am in a situation to be able to get to listen to people, but I still know I make lots of mistakes and do things that I'm not always proud of. Um, but you know, again too, I'm like, it gives me space to know, well, you're human, we're doing the best we can. and. Go from there. I'm, for one, appreciative of you sitting down and giving us a few minutes mm -hmm. to uh, yeah. spill your beans and talk about things that are personal, um, yeah. but also they're foundational. Mm -hmm. They, those difficult parts of our story often are the are the bedrock foundations to who we can become. Yeah. And for so many of us who had a background in Mormonism, who uprooted that oak tree that has been so vibrant and large and and welcoming in the front yard to then show up and see that there's this wide open hole where something so profound once was mm -hmm. requires us to begin to refill and retool that space for sure and it's not easy faith transi transitions are difficult finding new community is difficult understanding who and what we are is often difficult. Yeah. And I think your story is, is one of uh, additional pieces of evidence that life moves on. It does. And that there is happiness on the side of the aisle. For sure. That not everything that was foretold by prophets ancient and modern have come true. Absolutely. That, that you can thrive. Thank goodness. How, yeah, hallelujah to that. That's yeah. absolutely for sure. So again, thank you for giving us a My couple pleasure. minutes to peek into your life, to be vulnerable for a minute, but also to give someone hope. Absolutely. Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. And I uh, look forward to being in touch in the future. Great. Thank you, Cole.
another podcast episode here on Latter Gay Stories podcast. We thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand the experiences of the LGBTQ community, especially where they meet at LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. This has been another great episode where we really get a candid and vulnerable look at what someone experiences, and I hope you felt that as well. If you would like to ask Cole a question or have a question for the general podcast audience and you are watching on a video version, we invite you to share your comment below. If you are on Facebook, make sure you jot that below and we're, well, we'll respond and discuss that. And if you are on our YouTube channel, we invite you to click the share and subscribe button and we will uh, be able to kind of follow and watch there. The Latter Gay Stories podcast is your opportunity to better understand these intersections. It's also your place to build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ communities. But most importantly, it's stories just like Cole's that help us to continue writing our Latter Gay Stories. <laughs>